Hello and welcome, Theresia Reinhold. It's an honor to have you here um, with your movie. And uh, I hope uh, you will just talk, uh, tell us a little bit about it. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. And uh, also after the movie, our hosts, uh, not hosts, sorry, our panelists who are absolutely amazing and absolutely worth listening to. Um, the documentary is called Information, What Are They Looking At? And it's um, exploring the connection between the issue around privacy and surveillance combined with an insight into colonialism, anti-Muslim terrorism, and how it affects communities who aren't belonging to the most powerful communities in the world, which are you know, so-called Western and mostly white people. Um, and yeah, that's what it's about in a nutshell. Um, you tease it about that movie uh, in 2017, which was um, our second Privacy Week. So I'm really excited having you here with the, with the uh, final uh, movie today. And I'm really happy to uh, let's uh, all together watch that movie. And uh, just a short question. How often did you show it already? Uh, I showed it twice, um, okay. and so this is the, the third um, public screening. It is online though, so I don't know how many people have watched it in the meantime, but uh, two official screenings. Okay, really, really cool. Um, yeah, just um, have a question um, into um, the technical team. Um, everything fine for the go for the movie? Oh, what's, by the way, the English word for film up? Screen on. <laughs> ja. Also, ich habe gerade nichts gehört. Nein, ich höre jetzt gerade nichts mehr aus dem, aus dem GC. Soll ich schon starten? Yes, screen on. Is often connect is freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom of organization, freedom of assembly. These are really seen as underpinning rights of what we see as democratic values. Just because you have safety does not mean that you cannot have freedom. Just because you have freedom does not mean you cannot have safety. Why is the reaction to doubt it rather than to assume that it's true and act accordingly? We need to be able to break those laws that are unjust. Privacy, in essence, becoming a de facto crime, that somehow you're hiding something. So just to be sure, let's not have any privacy. came about, um, communication was generally one editor to many, many readers. Um, but now it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So, you know, at a touch of a button, people have um, opportunity to reach millions of people. It's revolutionizing the way we communicate. One of the things that Facebook, and to a lesser degree Twitter, allowed people to do is be able to see that they weren't alone and it was able to create a critical mass and i think that that's a very important role that social media took on it was able to show people in a very easy way in people's facebook feeds oh wow look at tahir square there's people out there and in bahrain and pearl square which people could feel before walking out their door into real life action that they could see that they were not in I that they were not isolated in their their desire for some sort of change the great promise of the internet is freedom where the mind is without fear and the head is held high and the knowledge is free because the promise was this will be the great equalizer before the social web before the web 2.0 anything you were doing was kind of anonymous by the very concept of anonymity, 
you were able to discuss things that would probably be not according to the dominant themes or the dominant trends or values of, of your own society. Ja, ich finde diese Diskussion um die Frage, wie man mit der Behauptung, ich habe nichts zu verbergen, umgeht, auch nach vielen Jahren ähm, keineswegs äh, langweilig oder so. Denn dieser Satz ist sehr kurz, aber sehr perfide. Der Sprecher, der mir den Satz, ich habe nichts zu verbergen, entgegenschleudert, der sagt nicht nur was über sich selbst, sondern er sagt in der Regel auch was über mich. Denn dieser ich habe nichts zu verbergen Satz eigentlich oft, äh, ohne dass es ausgesprochen wird, die Komponente du doch auch nicht, oder? Insofern finde ich diesen Satz auch immer ein Stück solidaritätslos, weil man ja sich gleichzeitig nicht dafür einsetzen will, dass der andere, der vielleicht was zu verbergen hat, das kann. One of the things about privacy is that it's not always about you. It's about the people in our networks. And so, for example, I have a lot of friends who are from Syria, um, people that I've met in other places in the world, not necessarily refugees, people who've lived abroad for a while, um, but those people are at risk all the time, both in their home country and often in their host countries as well. And so I might say that I have nothing to hide. I might say that there's no reason that I need to keep myself safe. Um, but if you've got anyone like that in your network, any activists, any people from countries like that, it's thinking about privacy and thinking about security means thinking about keeping those people safe too. Privacy is important because if we think of the alternative, if everything is public, if the norm is public, then anything that you want to keep to yourself has an association of guilt attached to it. And that should not be the world that we create. That's a chilling effect. It's a chilling effect on, on, on our freedoms. It's, it's a chilling effect on democracy. To me, human rights are something which has been put in place to guarantee the freedoms of every single person in the world. They're supposed to be universal, indivisible. Having those rights makes you human in the eyes of this system. They're collecting data and metadata about hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And some of that data will never be looked at. That's, that's a fact, we know that. But at the same time, assuming that just because you're not involved in activism or you're not well known, that you're not going to be a target at some point, I think that's what can be really harmful to us. Right now, you may not be under any threat at all, but your friends might be, your family might be, or you might be in the future. And so that's why we need to think about it this way, not because we're going to be you know, snatched out of our homes in the middle of the night now, but because this data and this metadata lasts for a long time. My observation is that we are gerade jetzt erleben, that the der, der private Raum, also the Raum der in der digitalen Welt ne, ähm, privat äh, sein und bleiben sollte, ähm, langsam ähm, zu erodieren beginnt, beziehungsweise durchlässig äh, zu werden beginnt. Und zwar nicht nur faktisch, faktisch natürlich klar, aber nicht nur faktisch, sondern auch in der Wahrnehmung. Ich stelle mir die digitale Welt vor wie ein Panoptikum. Ja, das ist dieses von Jeremy Bentham entworfene ähm, ringförmige Gebäude. Ähm, in äh, dem Ring äh, sind in den einzelnen Zellen die Häftlinge untergebracht und in der Mitte ist ein Wachtturm. Und da sitzt ein Wachtmann und dieser Aufseher, der kann die Häftlinge, die Zellen um ihn herum die ganze Zeit beobachten und überwachen. Und der Trick dabei ist, dass die Häftlinge ähm, nicht wissen können, ob sie gerade beobachtet werden. Die sehen nur den Turm, aber die sehen nicht den Aufseher. Aber die wissen ganz genau, dass sie jederzeit permanent beobachtet werden können. Und diese Tatsache übt eine verändernde, entscheidende Auswirkung auf sie aus. I think surveillance is a, is a technology of governmentality. It's a technology, it's a biopolitik political technology. It's there to control and manage populations. 
it's really propelled by state power and the power of entities that are glued in, that cohere around the state, right? So it's there as a form of, of population management and control. So you have to convince people that it's in their interest. And it's like, you know, every man for himself and everyone is out to get everyone. I take my cue from a uh, former general counsel of the NSA, Stuart Baker, who said on this question, metadata absolutely tells you everything about somebody's life. If you have enough metadata, you don't really need content. It's sort of embarrassing how predictable we are as human beings. So let's say that you make a phone call um, one night, you call up um, a suicide hotline, for example, you're feeling down, you call that hotline. Um, and then, you know, a few hours later, maybe you call a friend, a few hours later, you call a doctor, you send an email, and so on and so forth. Now, the contents of that of those calls and those emails are not necessarily being collected. What's being collected is the time of the call, the, the place that you called. And so sometimes in events like that, those different pieces of metadata can be linked together to profile someone. David's description of what you can do with metadata and quoting a mutual friend, Stuart Baker, is absolutely correct, okay? We kill people based on metadata. But that's not what we do with this metadata. Thankfully. <laughs> wow, I was working up a sweat there for a second. You know, the impetus for governments for conducting this kind of surveillance is often, at least in rhetoric, to go after terrorists. And obviously we don't want terrorism, and so that, that, uh, that justification resonates with most of the public. But I think that there's a couple problems with it. The first is that they haven't demonstrated to us that surveillance actually works in stopping terrorist attacks. We haven't seen it work yet. It didn't work in Paris, it didn't work in Boston, it didn't work elsewhere. So that's one part of it. But then I think the other part of it is that we spend billions of dollars on surveillance and on war, but spend very little money on addressing the root causes of terrorism. I had this debate Sicherheit versus Freiheit from Popanz. Then these Werte stehen sich nicht gegenüber. Und ich kaufe diese Propaganda auch nicht mehr. Das ist schlicht, weil viele der Maßnahmen, die wir in den letzten zehn Jahren über uns ergehen lassen mussten, in puncto staatlich erzwungene Überwachung, kein mehr an Sicherheit bedeuten. Und ich schon deshalb diese Debatte darum, ob wir Freiheit opfern für mehr Sicherheit, ähm, nicht mehr führen mag. I think power is, is concealed in the whole discourse around surveillance. And the way it's concealed is through this legitimization that it's in your interest, that it keeps you safe. And so, but there have been uh, many instances where citizens groups have actually fought against that kind of surveillance. And I think there's also sort of the mystique around the technologies of surveillance. There is the whole sort of like this notion that Ah, because it's a technology and it's designed to do this, it's actually working. But all of this is a concealment of power relations because who can surveil who is the issue, right? It, it isn't the majority of the English population here who gets stopped and searched. It's, it's um, non-white people. Um, it isn't the majority of um, non-white people who get approached to, you know, inform on their community. It's, it's Muslim communities surveillance that one does on the other you know so at the airport it's the other passengers that say ah so and so is speaking in arabic um and therefore that person becomes the subject right uh, the target of that hyper surveillance so it's the kind of surveillances that are being exercised by each of us on the other because of this sort of like culture of fear that has being uh, nourished in a way, and that's mushrooming all around us. And these are fears that I think are, they go anywhere from the most concrete to the most vague.
In, in this way, I think this is another way of um, creating a semblance of control, where um, this, this identity is very easily visible, it's very easily targeted, and it's very easily defined. Für mich ist die politische Diskussion eine reine Angstdiskussion, wo man die Ängste der Menschen, die eher berechtigt sind, ausnutzt und wo man auch rassistische Stereotype wiederholt. Und ich halte das für ausgesprochen gefährlich, dem immer mehr nachzugeben. Auch weil ich glaube, dass man natürlich damit sehr negative Instinkte bei Menschen verstärkt. Ausgrenzung, uh, auch uh, racial profiling. It's uh, inherently disenfranchising, it's disempowering and it's isolating. When you feel you're being treated as a different person to the rest of the population, that's when measures like surveillance, um, things that are enabled by technology, really hit home and, and, and cause, uh, um, you know, and, and, and cause you to sort of change the way you feel as a subject. Because at the end of the day, you are you are a subject of a government. Wie kommt es denn, dass diese Massenüberwachungsprogramme jahrelang geheim gehalten wurden, wenn sie angeblich so sinnvoll und effektiv sind? Warum hat sich denn niemand dafür öffentlich gerechtfertigt? Warum wurde das dann alles im Geheimen von geheimen Gerichten mit geheimen Gerichtsurteilen gerechtfertigt? Warum kommt die Kommission von Geheimdienstlern, die eigens Obama eingesetzt hat nach Beginn des neuen Veröffentlichen, zu dem Ergebnis, dass kein einziger Null der Fälle von Terror oder Terror, versuchten Terroranschlägen durch diese riesenhaften Telekommunikationsmetadaten auch nur im Ansatz geklärt wurde. In trying to stop something from happening before it happens, um, they can put in a, a measure and that thing might not happen, but they don't know if that measure stopped that thing from happening because that thing never happened. It's hard to measure, you can't measure it. And you can't say with certainty that it's because of this measure that that didn't happen. But after 9-11, after you know, the catastrophic level of that attack, um, it put decision makers into this um, impossible position where citizens were scared, they needed to do something. One part of that is trying to um, screen everybody objectively and have that sort of panopticon surveillance of saying that no no we, we can see everything don't worry you know we have we have the haystack we just need to find the needle uh, but then you know obviously they need ways to target that you can see it most clearly over here you got um, leaflets through your door a few years ago um, basically saying um, has if you've seen anything suspicious call this hotline and it listed things like um, the neighbor who goes away on holiday um, like many times a year or you know uh, if like you know another neighbor whose curtains are always drawn you know it it just changes the way you look you look at society you look at yourself um, and it shifts the presumption of innocence to a presumption of guilt already when um, is jemand ja, ein potenzieller Selbstmordattentäter. Damit äh, fängt das ja Problem an, nicht? Wenn er ähm, einen Sprengstoffgürtel trägt und äh, den Zünder schon in der Hand hält, oder wenn er sich äh, bereits Bauteile für einen Sprengstoffgürtel äh, besorgt hat, oder wenn er sich erst im Internet darüber informiert hat, wie man einen Sprengstoffgürtel äh, bastelt. Ne? Wann darf der Staat rechtmäßig eingreifen? Für mich geht es da ganz zentral um die ähm, sehr problematische Frage, ob jemand, der ein potenzieller Gefährder, als ein potenzieller Gefährder oder als ein potenzieller Terrorverdächtiger eingestuft worden ist, ohne ein Terrorist zu sein, ja, ob so jemand deswegen rechtmäßig überwacht werden darf oder sogar festgenommen werden darf. Das heißt, ob gewissen Personen dadurch, dass sie eine konkrete Gefahr für die Gemeinschaft darstellen könnten, fundamentale Menschenrechte abgesprochen werden dürfen. Und dann wir uns face à eine Menace inégale, die va durer et euh, sa particularité par rapport à d'autres menaces terroristes que nous avons pu connaître et qui s'attaquent à ce que nous sommes, à nos valeurs, à nos 
mode de vie, à notre art de vie. Mais nous pensons aussi qu'il faut l'union de la sécurité et tous les éléments constitutifs. For over 15 years now, we have observed a big populist push to adopt even more uh, surveillance measures. With the attacks of the past years, there was an opportunity to pass even more. We have this proposal for a new directive whose contents are purely based on ideology. Als Antiterrorismusrichtlinie wurde der im Eilverfahren durchgebrachte Gesetzestext verabschiedet. Der grünen Abgeordnete Jan Philipp Albrecht schrieb in einer Stellungnahme an Netzpolitik.org, was die Richtlinie als Terrorismus definiert, könnte von Regierungen genutzt werden, um politische Aktionen oder politischen Protest zu kriminalisieren. These uh, type of laws actually are neutral in principle. In practice, they are very discriminatory. If you talk to any politician right now at the EU level or, or at the national or local level, they will tell you that most likely these people are Muslims. Historisch und philosophisch ist uh, dieses Problem uns uh, längst bekannt. Nicht? Also wir neigen immer dazu, alles, was uns unangenehm ist, was uns unheimlich ist, ja, an den Horizont zu stellen. Das ist uns fremd. Ja. Das tun andere, wir nicht. Ja. Und wenn, wenn es unser einer tut, dann muss er verrückt sein. Und das ist Edward Said's point of view, right? That the Western self came to define itself in relation to this Eastern other. So everything that the West was, the East wasn't. And everything that the East was, the West wasn't. And so the East became this province of emotionality, irrationality, and the West became this source of reason, everything controlled and contained and so forth. And it's this dichotomy that continues to play itself out. Terrorismus tauchte auf als Begriff zum ersten Mal im Kontext der Französischen Revolution. Die Jakobiner, die unter Robespierre die Schreckensherrschaft errichtet hatten, also La Terreur, das waren die ersten Terroristen, so wurden sie genannt. Der erste Terrorismus war der Terrorismus des Staates. Und dazu gehörte natürlich auch die systematische Überwachung von Contra-revolutionary. The proposal of the directive says that it complies with human rights. Uh, it actually does not, because they want to increase surveillance measures in order for the population to feel safer. However, we've seen that more repressive measures do not necessarily mean that you would have more security. And the way you sell it to people is to appease their sense of anxieties around, ah, oh, this is an insecure world. Anything could happen at any time, right? And so if anything can happen at any time, what can we do about it? You get the feeling that this text is trying to make sure that law enforcement will be able to get access to communications by any means that they wish. To be able to stop something from happening before it happens, you have to know everything. You have to look at the past, look at what's happened, but then also predict the future by looking at the past and then getting as much information as you can on everything, all the time. So it's about, you know, zero risk. Alle entwickelten Demokratien haben so eine Art Konzept wie Verhältnismäßigkeit, wie das hier in Deutschland genannt wird, dass man eben die Überwachungsmaßnahmen gegeneinander abwiegt, äh, nämlich auf der anderen Seite die Grundrechte zu beachten hat. Und dazu gehört zweifelsohne ähm, die Privatsphäre. In Deutschland ist sie ja sehr hoch angesiedelt, sie wird unmittelbar von der Menschenwürde abgeleitet und die ist nur in sehr geringem Maße verhandelbar. When we are afraid to speak, either because of our government coming after us or because of a partner or a boss or whomever. Um, you know, all sorts of surveillance causes self-censorship. But I think that mass surveillance, the idea that everything we're doing is being collected, can cause a lot of people to think twice before they open their mouths. When all your likes uh, can be traced back to you, of course it affects your behavior. Of course, it's usually the case that sometimes you think if you like this thing or if you don't, then you would, it would have some social repercussions for you. But if you look throughout history, the Reformation, um, the gay rights movement, all of these movements were illegal in some way, if not by law strictly, then by um, culture. And if we'd had that kind of mass surveillance then, would we have had those movements? If all laws were absolutes, 
then we would never have progressed to the point where women had equal rights because women had to break the laws that said you can't have equal rights. Black people in America had to break the laws that said that they could not have equal rights. And there's a common thread here. You know, a lot of our laws historically have had the harshest effects on the most vulnerable in society. Die Komponente, dass man damit auch meint, äh, wenn du was zu verbergen hast, bist du ja auch selber schuld, die ist aus meiner Sicht erst in den letzten Jahren hinzugekommen. Insbesondere äh, der ehemalige Chef von Google, Eric Smith, der ist natürlich dafür bekannt, dass er das auch tatsächlich so gesagt hat. If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Aber das natürlich in einer Weise menschenfeindlich, die ist schon fast wieder lustig. Ja, da könnte man eigentlich schon wieder denken, das ist Satire. Viele Menschen können nichts dafür, dass sie Dinge zu verbergen haben in einer Gesellschaft, die ungerecht ist. But if you really need that kind of privacy, the reality is that search engines, including Google, do retain this information for some time. Big corporations that have this business model of people farming are interested in you because you are the raw materials, right? Your information is the raw materials. What they do is they process that to build a profile of you. And that's where the real value is. Because if I know enough about you, if I have so much information about you that I can build a very lifelike, constantly evolving picture of you, a simulation of you, that's very valuable. The economy of the net is predicting human behavior so that eyeballs can be delivered to advertising and that's targeted advertising. This system in one way is set up for them to make money and sell our little bits of data, our interests, our demographics for other people and for advertisers to, to be able to sell things. And these companies know more about us than we know about ourselves. Right now we're feeding the beast. Right now there's very little oversight. It has to reach one person the same ad at a particular time. If at 3 p.m. you buy this soda and you eat your lunch, then how about 2.55 you get an ad about discount of a pizza place? next door or a salad place and where exactly the soda comes. That's what targeted advertising is. It's true, it is convenient. Um, you know, I, I always laugh every time I'm on a site and looking at, let's say, a sweater that I want to buy and then I move over to another site and that, an advertisement for that same sweater pops up and reminds me how much I want it. Um, it's both convenient and annoying. It's a pity that some of the greatest minds of our century are only wondering how to make you look at some advertisement. And that's where the surveillance economy begins, I would say, and not just ends. To a lot of people that may seem much less harmful, but the fact that they're capturing that data means that that data exists and we don't know who they might share it with. There's a whole new business now, you know, data brokers who draw upon, you know, thousands of data points and create client profiles to sell to companies. You know, you don't really know what happens with those kind of things. So it's hard to tell what the implications are until it's too late, until it's happened. The Stasi compared to Google or Facebook were amateurs. The Stasi actually had to use people to surveil you, to spy on you. That was expensive. It was time consuming. They had to pick targets. They, it was very expensive for them to have all of those people spying on people. Facebook and Google don't have to do that. They use algorithms. That's the mass in mass surveillance. The fact that it is so cheap, so convenient to spy on so many people. And it's not a conspiracy theory. You don't need conspiracies when you have the simplicity of business models. When, when we talk about algorithms, we actually talk about a logic. When you want to, for example, buy a book on Amazon, you have always uh, seen a few other suggestions. These suggestions are produced for you based on a history of your preferences, a history of your searches. They learn by making mistakes. And the thing is, you know, that's fine if it's like selling uh, dog food. But <laughs> if it's about predictive policing and about creating a matrix where you see which um, individuals are threatening, that's not okay. To me, you know, there has to be limits, there has to be lines. Um, and 
these are all the dynamics that are coming from the bottom up these are all the discussions that need to be had but they need to be had with all the actors they can't just it can't just be an echo chamber you can't talk to the same people who agree with you so one consequence of this would be many minorities or many people who have minority views would be silenced and we always know that when a minority view is silenced it would empower them in a way and it would radic radicalize, radicalize them in the long run. This is one aspect. The other is that um, you would never be challenged by anyone who disagrees with you. We have to understand that our data is not exhaust. Our data is not oil. Data is people. You may be not doing anything wrong today, but maybe three governments from now when they pass a certain law, what you have done today might be illegal, for example. And governments that keep that data can look back over 10, 20 years and maybe start prosecuting. When everything we, we buy, uh, everything we read in a way, and ev even, even the people we meet and date is determined, by these algorithms, I think the amount of power that they exert on, on, on the society and on in, individuals in the society is more than the, the states to some degree. Um, so there I think representative democracies have a duty to push, uh, to push the government to open up these private entities and to at least expose to some degree how much control they exert. Wenn man die technologische Perspektive einnimmt und sich natürlich klar macht, dass die Technik noch sehr viel mehr in unser Leben hineinrutschen wird, als sie ohnehin schon ist. Also auch wirklich technisch in unsere Körper, in unsere Kleidung, in, in die Geräte, in denen wir sitzen und die wir tragen, ja, in, in alle möglichen Bereiche unseres Zusammenlebens, unseres Arbeitslebens, dann ist das definitiv der falsche Weg, weil er letztlich zu einer totalitären Überwachung führt, die eigentliche Dichotomie besteht aus Kontrolle versus Freiheit. Und eine vollständig kontrollierte Gesellschaft kann nicht frei sein. Okay, done. Uh, ganz, uh, oh, sorry, right, English. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I hope you all found this movie so interesting as I just did. It, I think it's really, really uh, important work, uh, what Teresa brought us here. Um, uh, in, a, in a minute, uh, I will have uh, four great panelists again, and I'm really excited about that. So um, you will just uh, see uh, Teresa, uh, Theresia Reinhold. I'm very sorry, Theresia Reinhold. She's a documentary filmmaker, obviously, and a historian. And um, maybe you can just say hello and uh, come into the stream. Hello. Yes, thank you all very much for bearing with us through this movie and the following discussion. Um, we also have uh, Jasmine Chivani. Uh, she's a full prof uh, professor in the Department of Communication Studies at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, and I think I said it wrong. I, I think it is Montreal, right? Montreal. We. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, great having you. Thank you. 
We have uh, Kirsten Fiedler. Um, she's a digital rights activist. And uh, before she um, started working at policy advisor in the European Parliament, um, she actually was um, Europe uh, director, managing director at uh, IDRI, European Digital Rights. Hello, Kirsten. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Hello. And we have Marianne, uh, Mariant, right? Uh, Fernandez Perez. And she's a lawyer and senior digital policy officer at uh, BOIC. And that's the European Consumer Organization. And she represents 44 consumer associations from 32 countries. Hello, Marianne. Hello, thanks also for the invitation. Just to clarify that that today uh, I'll be speaking uh, on my personal capacity because the documentary I just have seen was uh, when I was uh, at another job. <laughs> but I'm still working on, on these very important issues. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, first questions to Theresia. Theresia, what did you make uh, or why did you make this movie? Um, wow, that's a, that's a that's a hard question. So um, the Snowden revelations happened, and uh, I thought, well, what so many th people also thought, you know, I was confused about it, and I was surprised about it, but at the same time, not really surprised about it, because somehow it seemed like something that would take place. Um, and my family... Uh, is from the former GDR, so I grew up hearing, you know, a lot of stories around state surveillance and dictatorships and all the negative repercussions repercussions it can have. Um, and when I started uh, working um, first in my, you know, entirely private little world as a student on these privacy and surveillance issues, I realized that the debate is mostly, not all the time, but mostly dominated by white men from Western countries, or so-called Western countries, who have comparatively little to fear, or often when they have something to fear, it's because they put themselves in a position. And I'm not trying to say that they should have something to fear because it was their own you know, desire to become an activist. I'm not saying that at all. But it's just very different from millions and millions of other people who just go about their day-to-day -day lives trying to, you know, feed their families and be happy and are being repressed every day just because of who they are. And that's why I decided to make a movie where people who are not usually in the debate so often and so prominently, especially five years ago when I started, are actually the ones who are talking and who are sharing what they think is mostly important. Yeah. Um, question to the uh, other three. Uh, how was it being invited to that um, extraordinary project? Marian, maybe you first. Thank you very much. So it felt like a privilege, really, um, because it was a way to showcast uh, the work that we were doing to ensure that people's rights and freedoms are respected in the European Union. Um, so it was great because also, you know, Theresia was uh, going through various topics um, on privacy, you know, from law enforcement to corporate surveillance uh, and interviewing many different people. And so I think she had a story to tell and I think it's clear. <laughs> uh, Jasmine, you're already nodding. <laughs> it's true. Um, it was a real honor to be in this film. Uh, for me, it was the issue of uh, surveillance and privacy has also to do with the gendered element of it, which is how, in fact, some bodies are hyper-profiled and others are made invisible. So, you know, in the context of looking at these, this, the, the whole sort of economic element of it, I think what Theresia's work does is actually bring out that other element, which is the hidden and the invisible and how, in fact, the, visit, the regimes of visibility that make certain bodies, uh, that, are, that profile certain bodies even more than others, kind of take the attention away from the insidiousness of surveillance as it affects everyone. So for me, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. 
And Kirsten, how about you? Well, as you could see in the documentary, I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> so I um, discovered, I think, a couple of months ago when Teresa showed us uh, her uh, piece uh, for the first time that I was in the movie. And uh, yeah, it was a very nice surprise and uh, uh, really an outstanding uh, piece of work. Um, so. Uh, really great job, Theresia. I think you did a super great job just putting all of the different threats about surveillance, privacy, and discrimination together into a very nice narrative. So, um, yeah, very happy to discover that I could be a part of it. Thank you all. That's so nice. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a really great piece of work and I'm really happy uh, to have you all here to, to talk about, about the topic a bit more um, because even for me, um, since I'm, I'm um, working, working as an activist uh, for a couple of years now already, um, it was um, a, a shift of perspective in, in a certain way. So some things weren't that prominent to me when I watched the movie and was like, yeah, of course, how couldn't I have seen that? And um, it was real revelation. So probably if that happened to me, that also happened to uh, some of the people who just uh, watched the movie uh, with us um, or are watching it right now um, in um, uh, a bit later. So, um, I think the um, the first sentence that struck me was it's also always about the others and that was there was a yes of course and the question of responsibility for other people in our community um, and I see Jasmine nodding maybe you want to begin here it is about the others but I think I mean the the critical thing is it is there is a process where when something appears visible it's against an invisible background so what is the invisible background and what's rendered visible that i think is the dynamic of power that plays itself out here so when you have certain bodies like muslim bodies that are rendered hyper visible and the focus is on there all of the other machinations of the state keep going on behind in ways that are deemed innocuous and innocent so um, the whole data mining, for instance, the fact that, that all your movements are being tracked, all your purchases are being tracked, your profile is being built up, all of this is sort of happening against this sort of invisibilized background of normativity. You know, it's clothed in normativity. And in front of this, ex-nominated from it, in a way, is the, the body that, that has all this hyper-attention on it so that this other stuff can go on in the background. And that's how this power works. And that's why, you know, I would argue that, yes, you definitely need the other, because how else are you going to deflect attention from what it is that you're doing um, and make it seem so, sort of normalize it so much that it doesn't raise any hackles in a way. And, you know, it won't do that unless there are whistleblowers who come out and point to it. So it's, it's allowing that algorithm to keep working while at the same time claiming that it is in the interest of national security, it's in the interest of protecting society, that we, that we need to look at these particular bodies. And probably society is just a question of definition then. So uh, if you define society as uh, um, a whole group of old white men uh, that need to be protected from all the others and the rest of the world, um, then society becomes something very small. True, but I think it's also has to, I mean, pivotal in any sort of national discourse and and the privacy and the security the whole surveillance system actually rests on this which is the notion of borders right our borders our society so pivotal in that is the us and them distinction we and them and that's why you need the other body but that doesn't mean to say that that the violence of surveillance isn't going on all the time it is 
I mean, in some of the work that I've done around, which touches on the surveillance issue, is the focus on honor killings, for instance, which is to say, every time there's an honor killing or every time there is a, a, a femicide that happens in a Muslim community, suddenly it becomes big news. When in fact, if we start to look at the background, there's tons of femicides that are going on all the time and that don't get that attention. So what does it mean when a particular culture and a cultural body is isolated and all the attention put on it, which makes us forget about the backdrop where all of this stuff is happening all the time, but at the same time then allows the state to equip itself with, with the rationality and the rationalization that such surveillance mechanisms are an absolute necessity. So, you know, and that these bodies are within our borders and have to be either expelled or neutralized or annihilated. Hmm. I see Marian nodding. <laughs> Would you like to say something? And sure, I think in the film, what I, I like is indeed, I mean, privacy it can be both an individual matter. I mean, it's important, at least for people, individuals, to really get their privacy respected as an individual thing, but it's also very important to consider the societal uh, aspects. What is also important, and that's why I was noting, is that privacy is also interlinked with other human rights, like non-discrimination, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of movement, and so that's quite greatly reflected in the film in the sense that, um, you know, it's not just about the hiding something. It's clear that it's about your fundamental right uh, to be in control. And, and currently, we don't have that control, uh, neither from the state nor uh, for from corporations. Of course, there's good fights um, in the sense that we're trying to, you know, limit that power. That's what the legislators uh, try to do, but uh, more importantly, we need more uh, enforcement, um, right? And um, I think another thing that is very clear is that, you know, privacy is not just about the present, it's about the future. And then here, what is at stake is the future of our democracy, uh, which is not often talked about, uh, which is another interlink of the right to privacy. Yeah. Jasmine, <laughs> you were just... Uh saying so uh, happily, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to agree with that because it is the idea, like fundamentally the threat is is our democracy in the sense that what are we as, as agents in a way um, and agenting people as participants in a democracy, we're not even, in fact, many of the times we're not even being told that we're being surveilled, which is a fundamental violation of rights. Hmm. Yeah, um, probably for the moment, um, just a reminder for our audience uh, who are watching the stream right now, uh, you have the possibility to ask us questions. So uh, you can um, use the button on the Privacy Week uh, streaming website uh, where you can ask us uh, anonymously or you can uh, tweet or toot um, with uh, the hashtag PW20 or PW20 online and uh, ask us things and um, we'll have an helping angel who will uh, give us the, um, uh, the questions into our great round here. Mm. So we just uh, stop at uh, the threat for democracy. <laughs> And um, I think this is something that's uh, always totally underrated. So most people do not see the the connection to um, to our um, yeah societal principles uh, we live with. Um, maybe Kirsten, <laughs> you just know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to get really frustrated about this whole discussion, security versus freedom, and I, and I really have the impression that it's a debate that it's like 100 years old, or maybe I'm, I've been working in this field for too long, I don't know, either of the two. Um, but, I mean, we can see it even today that after every terrorist attack, uh, uh, political leaders are asking us to sacrifice uh, some of our privacy rights for the sake of, of making our societies allegedly 
safer and more secure. And this is something that was very nicely pointed out in the film as well. And um, I think what what really need what, what people really need to understand is that governments, uh, in the end, um, all that all that they do is increasing their own surveillance powers uh, of their own agencies, which at least as far as I have seen so far, have never ever led directly to an increase of individuals' uh, uh, security, of the security of individual citizens. So it's really more about the security of the survival of the governmental security apparatus, I think. Um, and what frustrates me even more is uh, then to think that these surveillance measures are even worse than just inefficient. Um, so every terrorist, uh, anti-terrorist measure, every security measure that is introduced in the wake of, of terrorist acts, um, they have very, very often uh, been proven to be uh, counterproductive as they actually tend to decrease uh, our individual security even. Just to name a few examples uh, of so-called security measures, that lead to the exact opposite is, for example, now we hear it again, the push for backdoors and end-to-end -end encryptions, which of course everybody knows once they exist, they can be exploited by bad actors. Uh, then we have the massive and centralized collections of, of financial data, of air passenger data and so on to, to fight crime. But I mean, we all know here, people who are watching the stream, who have watched the movie, I think we, we have heard, especially since the Snowden revelations, that uh, blanket surveillance, surveillance measures are just simply not efficient. And I think here uh, we are coming to something that Jasmine also mentioned in the interview, in, in the documentary. Um, we have to ask why are these all these measures still being passed now? And it's uh, uh, because they are purely based on ideology. And it's um, I think it's the uh, purely the uh, conservative capitalist ideology um, that is driving most of our societies, our Western societies today, um, that makes the political leaders think um, that they can interfere with individual rights easier than uh, in order to establish more control over the population than, uh, for example, uh, introduce government interference into the economy. Um, so this is something that uh, really um, annoys me a lot. For reasons, I think this is uh, what was in the in the documentary with uh, population management, and um, also on, on the other hand, uh, the feeling of insecurity that is uh, furthered um, to to get the people uh, to yeah work along. Hmm. Okay, I see four people nodding. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if, if you followed the news um, um, just now. We had a terrible, terrible incident in France in uh, Conflans where a teacher, uh, a, a teacher was beheaded after um, talking about some uh, Muslim cartoons, I think it was. And the perpetrator posted the photo of the head on Twitter. And so now we had immediately uh, the calls for an end to anonymity online. Um, so again, I mean, every time it is the same old story. Um, now we had Commissioner Thierry Breton uh, saying that uh, whenever illegal content is being posted, then platforms should be able to identify the user who posted uh, the content. And um, sorry if I'm coming now with some political EU stuff. Mm. Uh, I hope people are not dropping out of the stream. But this is a discussion that I think uh, might also become very, very important in the frame of uh, in the framework of the uh, Digital Services Act that is going to be uh, coming soon. Mm. Yeah. 
uh, Theresia, you are um, nodding the most right now. <laughs> um, yeah, with just a, this debate, I could make a whole nother documentary. Um, no, I mean that on the whole issue of you know it being a, a threat to democracy, and what Marianne said that this is what most people forget or can't see because it's a big debate, and obviously not everyone you know has the the time and the privilege to to work on it. But what I find really important in this in this area is that we often sound like conspiracy theorists when we say these things, especially when we come from countries or are in countries like you know. We are here, Canada and Germany and Belgium, Spain and Austria, all countries that are, you know, these big democracies and everything is milk and honey and butterflies and happiness. But we forget that these rights that, that we have now or that are you know, considered normal to have right now can be rolled back and they are being rolled back around us. Mm -hmm. If you look at, um, I mean, just look at Trump. It's, it's a rights nightmare for millions of people. Um, if you look at what's happening with the LGBTIQA community in Poland right now, or if you look at um, the rollback of the right to safe abortions and you know the rights of trans people or the marriage for all in Germany, they're all attacks and pushes against these, um, these rights, which are not something completely, you know, um, it's not a crazy thought to have freedom and security for every person walking this earth, and we still have to fight for it. And obviously, when we have you know, no privacy and when everything we do online can be targeted back to us. If I look at some article about um, homosexuality and then in 10 years, my country decides that homosexuality should be an illegal um, thought to have, because looking at an article is first and foremost just a thought, it's not even an action, right? Yeah. And then they roll it back and they look at my data and they go, oh, if this person looked at that article, let's investigate her. Where are we going to end up? And we have, from a historical standpoint, I think we are constantly looking in the past thinking, oh, look how bad it was back then and it, this couldn't happen again, but it happens again. I mean, we are in the middle of a pandemic. We didn't thought that would happen anytime soon. Um, so I think we need to continue, you know, fighting on a very basic level with everyone we can reach to keep legislators in check and keep them informed about what is happening. And not just on paper and not just on Twitter, but on actual real um, laws that are going to be passed or hopefully not being passed in some cases. But to me, I think, you know, I, it's really great to hear you say all of this and, and to ground this, this discussion. But I keep coming back to something, which is uh, uh, the whole issue around these cartoons and the, car, the, the beheading being used as a justification, uh, which makes me wonder, well, you know, with all of the hate um, that's there on the internet, um, all of the racist stuff that's there, that's never put into check, right? So how is it, it's only in some instances where you have this kind of rationalization happening and not in others. So discursive violence is permitted. Uh, all kinds of violences are permitted as long as they're not violences that, um, that are seen to affect the whole of society. That's one thing. So if it's only women that are being targeted with all these sort of horrible sexist um, and it's, it's violent stuff, then, you know, that's all permitted. And that that's where the freedom of expression comes in and is used in a contrary way. Whereas when it's a, a thing like this, then it's suddenly the whole society. So I think that's one thing. But I think the other thing is the burden of representation that falls on minority groups. I think one can't look at this as if it's a, a, a lateral state. It's not. There's a hierarchy here in terms of belonging, in terms of citizenship, in terms of power, all of those kinds of things. So if a minority, if one radicalized Muslim from Chechnya does something, it casts a pal over the whole Muslim communities, which are extremely diverse, 
right? And uh, which uh, interpret Islam in, in so many different ways. And that's never taken into consideration. It's only this one that comes to represent the whole. So those factors, I think, always need to be to be computed um, or calibrated when we have discussions around privacy and freedom. Hmm. Yes, so right. Um, and it's always the the, the problem to um, to see one as a res representative for the whole not even a small community, but just the whole ever, ever lived on that earth. And, um, well, I'm thinking about that, that the guy who shot all those children, Anders Brevik, I can't mm -hmm. remember his last name. Brevik. Yeah, Brevik. I mean, he wasn't taken to be an example of the entire society. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, Teresa. Um, thank you for pointing this out. I think it's probably one of the most important points to be made. And if you if you look at you know who is described as a terrorist when when some attack happens, it's always someone who is considered to be Muslim. Whatever the media actually knows about this person's faith doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, this person looks a certain way and appears a certain way, so they must be a Muslim. So they are a terrorist. And if someone who's a white Swedish person or a white German does something. It's never terrorism. It's always this lone wolf who lost mm -hmm. his way. Um, and it's never put into this bigger issue. And I think that really changed. Um, I, I, I can't remember much before 9-11 because I was too young, but I get the impression that it really changed after 9-11 to this extreme way of especially anti-Muslim racism that swings within that. Yes. I got um, the same feeling there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if I can just also react quickly to uh, Jasmine. Um, I mean, you asked um, how, with all this racism and hatred online, how can we keep it under check? And uh, I think it's, it's almost impossible if uh, the business model on the internet that we have today uh, with the attention economy and uh, the targeted advertisement is allowed to continue as they are, are doing it today. I mean, platforms are making an, uh, shit loads of money, excuse my French, uh, mm -hmm. with that sort of content. Um, and if you look at how Google and Facebook are making most of their money, uh, it's uh, they are mostly in the business of advertisement. Um, a Wall Street Journal uh, report from, I think it was in May uh, of this year, revealed that Facebook ignored for years and years and years internal reports that were showing that its algorithms are uh, leading to even more polarization and divisiveness uh, uh, of their users. And this is only, I mean, they ignored it because they know uh, this sort of stuff retains user attention and so that they can display more ads. And um, uh, in, on this topic, we had a really very uh, revolutionary vote in the European Parliament last week. Um, I have to come back to EU policy making because that's my uh, job now. I'm working for uh, the Green MEP Alexandra Geze. So, um, this is one of our uh, focus topics right now. And um, the parliament last week adopted a resolution uh, where it asked the commission to uh, introduce much stricter rules for targeted advertising. Uh, that was one resolution. And another resolution that was adopted in parallel that even asked the commission to consider a prohibition of targeted advertisement um, after a phase out uh, period. And this is really something that if we can have this uh, sort of uh, legislation in Europe, um, of course, without touching uh, or reopening uh, uh, privacy laws that have been adopted in the past years, but just uh, um, starting to prohibit certain business practices that would be a huge step into the into the right direction i think that 
Uh, very true. And I think, but I think what happens is that the focus, your first point, which is the attentional economy is the most important. Because yes, the advertising is there. And a lot of the times the advertising on Facebook and these targeted ads are designed to draw that. But even in the work that I do, which is looking at news uh, sites, uh, which are not necessarily coupled with heavy duty advertising, although they, they do sell their spectators to ads. Um, they do do that. You know, there is the whole datification of the audience. But I'm thinking about online commenting and how that alone, for instance, is such a site of this, it's, it's intense hatred, you know, intense racism, intense sexism, homophobia, that's all there and that comes out. And for the newspapers, it's how many eyes are reading the stuff, that how many people are commenting is what gives them the revenue. So even newspapers, which are not necessarily your, you know, advertisers as such, but are there to provide a public service to tell you that what the news is of the day are trapped in this attentional economy with the dollars at the bottom. So the democratization of news is something that I think is like inherently uh, tied to this very issue, which is the lack of democracy that there is. If we don't have access to news, news that is nonpartisan, then how do we make decisions? That's one thing. But the other factor is that all of these sites, these platforms alone, like as you've said, I mean, platform racism is rife. They're encoded, They're, the biases are encoded in the programming. So unless we interfere in the programming of these sites and remake them, I can't see how we could change things. I'm not sure if there's anything such as uh, uh, unbiased uh, media, uh, but okay, if you think of, I don't know, Fox News, who's very... Uh, no, who's no, 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 I don't yeah, think of Fox yeah. News, yeah. Yes, or... I'm thinking I mean, of something like NPR or, you know, a ProPublica, uh, sites like that. Yeah, but, I, yeah, to my experience, um, uh, new, even news or reporting are always coming from some sort of political background. Mm. Um, we had the experience in, in the past years in Germany with uh, some um, conservative uh, uh, press outlets who were spreading um, lies about uh, my former NGO because we were uh, actively campaigning against the copyright directive. So um, I think this also has to be uh, um, digested with a lot of caution. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. There is no unbiased news service. But I'm thinking in the best possible worlds, we do have something close to those examples in the realm of alternative media. Maria. Yes, I mean, I want to say that I think there are many problems uh, on the internet, but also offline. And yes, we need to deal with them. And one of those problems is racism. I think, however, the solution cannot always be on the internet. I believe, uh, and I, I certainly am I'm sure, almost certain that what we need is really political leaders that would really think about the issue in a comprehensive manner. We're not gonna solve uh, this issue of racism, but just you know, eliminating, for example, all of the hatred in comments uh, of news outlets or just uh, stopping uh, some ads that you can see and have gained traction. We need also uh, initiatives offline. We need more education programs. We need integration programs. We need financing of people at risk. And this is not in the debate uh, generally. Um, I mean, uh, in the film, going back to the film a bit, um, we were, you know, Kirsten and I there were, were talking about a directive called the Terrorism Directive that actually came after the 2015 terrorist attacks in, in Paris. So this piece of legislation was uh, adopted within over a year. And it really um, basically was done without a proper input assessment and basically putting the emphasis that, you know, we're going to solve everything with the, with the rules on the internet. And then a few years later, now we have another law, the terrorist content regulation proposal that is still being debated right now. Um, and then talking about the very same issue, 
and then the beheading happens in France that you know the one that Kirsten explained and then yet again we're having the same conversation so if we want to really improve democracy and we want to challenge cor corporate surveillance but also mass surveillance and, and other economic and social problems like racism we need to have a more comprehensive strategy not just focus on removing things um, and part of the solution but not only for for resolving uh, illegal content online is to look at the business models of of, uh, mm. of these companies which by the way then they the, the 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 state afterwards goes to these corporations to get access to that data about us um, and so that's uh, you know in short, what we need is a really comprehensive um, strategy, not just uh, techno solutionism or you know just one set of bulletproof. I think otherwise we wouldn't be having this debate. I think. I agree. Hmm. <laughs> I think everyone just agreed totally. <laughs> what I see from from the faces, yeah. Uh, Theresia, you just also nodded. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, these are my notes I just took during this, you know, last 10 minutes. It's, it's a huge debate and we will always, I think, especially when it comes to um, hate speech and illegal content online, we will always, I get a feeling, be stuck in this kind of limbo of, of, of what is free speech and what is hate speech and where do you actually draw the line? Um, and we will always you know, have these two massive forces and activists of, on each side and, and, and policymakers on each side clash. And I think Marion is right in saying there has to be another solution because it's just, it keeps on going on. And whenever you know, I say something like, oh, um, you know, we have to be able to speak our mind freely, then someone comes around saying, yeah, but what, what about child pornography? which is always the end game. I mean, that's where everyone agrees that's not okay. And sure, it would be good if we had, you know, certain staples that we could say, so this is not okay anymore. But even if we do that, how far can we, can we actually go with this? If we have, for example, content by ISIS deemed as illegal content, can reporters still report on it then? Can it still be because to report on it and to talk about it, it has to be replicated in some ways, not entirely, obviously, but you can't discuss something, at least for you know, scientists, for example, without showing it, without being able to look at it. You can't have law enforcement have, uh, take place without looking at it. So if we leave it, we can't leave it to the platforms. I think we all agree on that because the platforms, A, don't want to do it and B, shouldn't do it because then they would become more powerful than the state and we have a really big problem um, but I think we need a totally new solution which I can't think of to be honest but I think um, since it's 2020 with all the the changes it brings with uh, all the, the things that are rapidly changing within our society or societies actually um, we do have a chance to change things right now. Um, probably not the ones we, we focus on first, but um, the, the movement is there because things are, are breaking around, only, uh, not only changing small things, but it's big changes uh, going on. So probably we could try to um to get those things moving together with the rest that we would like to have changed in our societies while it's uh, already uh, or while change is already going on so probably we can also see 2020 with everything it brings at least as a small chance for us I think you're really right about this being an opportunity because it, it just reminds me that during this COVID pandemic, how much of our lives are actually lived online, you know, uh, and mediated through so many different platforms, um, which have in which to take stock and assess 
uh, what is at stake, first of all, but also whether there are absolutes like freedom of speech, is it an absolute right versus the, the, the safety of others, right? So, I mean, this is like, there has to be a balance and that's one of the things about Canadian law, it does do that. Freedom of speech is not an absolute right. It has to be weighed in relation to societal concerns and societal well-being. Um, so I think we need to also sort of like tease those things apart. And this moment, this great pause, as they call it, allows us to do that. Uh, and perhaps sort of like reconvene, but looking at stuff in the sense that even though there is the offline world, which is the material world that is so real, so much of our lives are now mediated. And so what can we do in terms of those mediations and the platforms through which we're communicating? Marianne. So, yeah, I, I agree on the need to remain hopeful. I, I want to be an optimist because, you know, having discussions like this can lead you to frustrations and, you know, especially if you need to talk about this over and over again and we need change. And I think the first thing that we can do is create understanding and awareness because this does not really happen. Um, I mean, it's it's very difficult to, to talk about privacy uh, in particular with, with family members like, ah, you know, you're, you know, you're a bit crazy. Uh, I don't have anything to hide. I mean, you would think that after a few years <laughs> having internet and using digital services, people would be more aware. But um, actually with films like this and, and others that are popping up at the moment, people are becoming more aware. So after the awareness and understanding of, of problems, at least of the tip of the iceberg, we need to change. And, I mean, my job is, is to try to influence uh, policy making at the EU level. So that's how I try together with others to bring that change. But, you know, it can also come up by just talking to your neighbor, your friends, your family. I mean, um, it can be very silly, but uh, once they become aware, once we become aware of not only of the problem, but the need to change, I think we can, we can be hopeful that uh, we can have a better world. And it's, at the end of the day, it's up to us and up to our political leaders that we choose as, as a democratic society. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to remain positive. Uh, we can change this. I see broad smiles everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, if I can then go back also to the Brussels level in the past uh, uh, year, maybe a bit longer we've seen uh, a bit of a change of uh, opinions and mindsets here which gives me actually a lot of hope um, i think that more and more policymakers are actually understanding that uh, something is fundamentally wrong with the internet today that we need to start uh, building alternatives that we need to um, uh, hold especially the the big gatekeeping platforms more to account um, that we really need stronger rules on them and um, this year 2020 is not only the year of COVID-19 but um, if the commission hurries up the commission will present uh, I already mentioned it earlier the digital services act and in that Digital Services Act, we have the opportunity to push for transparency obligations for uh, all of the algorithms that these platforms are, are using to uh, uh, limit advertisement uh, and to maybe even push for really strong interoperability measures, which um, is for me, one of the most crucial aspects that would allow users to uh, break free of the really toxic environments and uh, data collection environments of the of the big ones, uh, and to uh, use start using different services to have more innovative other services that can come into the market, um, and yeah, to to allow users to really pick their preferred online discussion environment with um, you know moderation practices that um, 
where where the user has more control, where uh, um, you have less hate, less violence, and so on. So um, I'm I'm really hopeful in in that respect. Um, okay, we're getting into our last ten minutes, uh, and uh, probably a reminder for the people on the stream: you can ask us questions. So uh, either via the uh, form on the Privacy Week uh, streaming web uh, website. Sorry. <laughs> Um, via Twitter or Mastodon uh, with the hashtag PW20 um, or PW20 online. Um, since we just uh, came to the more positive and hopeful part, <laughs> and I'm really glad we have that, um, you already mentioned uh, the possibility to choose the, uh, the environment um, on the internet to uh, have your discussion there. Um, maybe a short question, uh, because it's already kind of popular um, with the, um, within the, the community of activists uh, and so on. There is that Fediverse, uh, Federated Universe with Mastodon and so on, where the um, servers federate with each other, each other and you can choose on which server you want to have your account and can still talk with all the other people on the same network. Um, is it something in that direction, what you just thought of, or do you have other um, uh, examples? Yeah, sure. I mean, that is the most uh, um, well-known example, I think, uh, at least among the uh, nerdy, geeky community that's watching us. Um, but um, uh, another example would be uh, interoperability of uh, messenger apps. Um, so I don't know how many uh, apps you have installed to talk to all of your people. Yeah, so, and we, right now, we don't really have the opportunity to uh, use one app, just one single app, and to communicate with your contacts on all of the other apps. So this is, uh, this is one of the, the other examples. Um, Theresia, you are so also grinning broadly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's because I'm really happy that we also uh, steered to a more positive note, because as Marion say, said before, this topic can be really frustrating and, well, as so many socially important topics, it's hard to fight for it every week of your life and not see any, any change. But um, I also agree that there is change. Um, slowly, but, but surely. Um, a big example is that so many you know, books and films on, on similar issues or on aspects of it are now you know, bestsellers or the, the Social Dilemma, this new Netflix documentary. Mm. Tons of people have seen it. People who've never watched documentaries. Um, or, you know, many people have read uh, all of these books like Invisible Women or Surveillance Capitalism, which give you a really good overview about certain issues. Um, there is this really amazing book right now in Germany on racism by Alice Hasters that has been, you know, I think even a, a Spiegel bestseller, which never happens with these kind of books and never happened 10 years ago. So there is a greater social appetite for change and for you know wanting the situation that so many people are in to get better we see this with fridays for future uh we see it with young people who are far more politically interested than my generation even was and that was like 15 years ago or a bit more but um and it, it does give me a lot of hope and i think um we need to be able to get these people who are interested and who want change into a position where they can have an influence, whether it's through activism or even, you know, get them into to build new startups with better technological solutions or, you know, become lawyers who fight against hate speech or work in the parliament um, of the country or supranational organization of your choice. Um, because I started working, I'm actually working with Kirsten in the parliament uh, since July last year, and it's the first time I've ever worked in politics. And it's, I came here being 
already disillusioned without actually having worked with people who want to make politics in a legislative real sense. And I find it really, um, the experience very positive. It's not always easy and it's not always straightforward and it's certainly not always transparent what is going on in here. Um, but just seeing people, also people from, di from different generations to each other fight for a similar um, vision of the world is, I find it very fascinating and positive. Hmm. Maybe for uh, one last hopeful round for all of us. <laughs> um, who wants to start? Jasmine. Well, if I were to go to the, the issue of hope, then my favorite sort of pedagogy of hope has always been the alternative media, because it's these platforms, even though they allow for the spewing of hate and uh, violent sexism and racism, um, also afford a lot of minority groups a way in which to counter and to come up with amazing, innovative ways to interrupt the dominant system. So to me, these are radical pedagogies of hope because in the face of erasure and hostility, one can still express oneself and articulate one's vision of society and, and what that should be like. So these are so, I mean, they range the whole spectrum from youth run websites to feminist sites and zines to uh, graffiti. Um, you've seen that Arabic graffiti uh, or light graffiti. There's so many different ways in which uh, no matter how much these systems sort of try and oppress, that human spirit comes out and articulates its and asserts itself in the most incredible ways. Um, Marianne? Yeah, so I think history has proven us right. We can be hopeful. I mean, um, humanity has recovered from very horrid events. And, you know, it's up to, to us to, to change that. Um, so, you know, we, we have really the power. We need to regain it. And the internet is now different from other historical events we've seen in the past. So, yeah, let's remain hopeful. Yeah, um, maybe a couple of words to the people who might have been a bit frustrated after the copyright directive uh, horrors. Um, just to say that, I mean, at the EU level, we also won so many different uh, important fights. Uh, we have a, a good uh, general data protection regulation. We have won, have, have won net neutrality. Um, so the EU uh, still does many, many, many positive things and has a very progressive uh, reputation also worldwide for good uh, digital policies. And I think uh, EU policymakers still need to see, uh, they need to continue to see that people are out there caring for those issues. So uh, please don't turn your back on the EU. Uh, just keep engaged and keep contacting your MEPs, even if they might not always like it, but uh, um, we have to make our voices still heard. Um, yeah and stay healthy, stay safe, I guess. Theresia. <laughs> um, I mean, what gives me hope is that conferences like this take place, organized by volunteers, um, that we even in the, it's a really dark year. I mean, it's not getting any better. We are heading towards the worst part of the whole damn thing, but I mean, we can have discussions like this online, which is a beautiful thing. If this was a normal, you know, real life conference, we would never have been able to have Yasmin here because hopping mm. over the uh, Atlantic just for an hour might be a bit extreme in times of climate change. So that gives me hope, you know, that we can, that we are actually using this terrible time to connect people together who just based on geographical distance couldn't make it before. Um, and yeah, and to 
round up what Kirsten said, stay safe, stay healthy, flatten the curve and wear your mask, please. <laughs> so uh, even uh, the, the sheep that uh, was or all the other years uh, sitting on the stage of Privacy Week, even this one has a mask. So <laughs> if the sheep can do it, you can do it. Right. <laughs> It's not Thank just about yourself, it's about the others. As it is for privacy, as it is for so many other things. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I've, I'm really, really happy having you here. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Um, real power women panel. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Thank you. And thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. And thank you once again, Theresia, uh, and also for the great documentary that hopefully will bring uh, a lot of enlightenment to more people. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. I'm so happy about this. You have no idea. I'm glowing from the inside, even though I'm all black, but glowing from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, thanks all the people who have watched in the stream. Um, thank you for having you here. Um, and uh, yeah, let's hope uh, this year will end at least some kind of well. Thanks. <laughs>